Welcome, dear viewers. Hi. Get comfy, make yourself a cup of tea. We are going to be here for a while, because today I am trying something completely different. And I was brewing this in my head, reading some Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell for quite some time, and realized, well, there is plenty of interesting meanings to extract from Skyrim. Meanings concerning some harsh existential truths and real-life mythology. And I mean mythology in general, not just the direct inspiration of Norse mythology, but the myth as the collective work of human imagination. So, it will be a symbolic interpretation of Skyrim and its main story. It will be something either completely mind-blowing or an awful headache. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Just as any good fantasy creation, Skyrim delves deep into real-world mythology in search of ageless motifs and archetypes that can inspire and has inspired generations. At first glance, the main story of the game tells a fairly familiar hero tale, a tale of saving the world by slaying some dragons. There are at least two storytelling details that set this particular story apart from a typical save a virgin from a dragon den cliché. The dragons of Skyrim do have some detailed and quite unique symbolism behind them, which is the main subject of this video. For instance, the dragon language is something rooted in very old traditions and does nod at myths even older than the Norse mythology, from which Skyrim takes plenty of ideas, of course. Skyrim dragons also have something divine about them. They are immortal and timeless, they have no gender and they once ruled over humankind. Even without these unique, let's say, features, a typical dragon is already a creature of many, many meanings. Just listen to this little interview with Dr. Jordan B. Peterson. You know, there, there's, there's good study published recently showing that six-month-old infants, I think it was six months, are already showing fear of snakes and spiders. And the evidence keeps accruing that some of these fundamental fears are innate. The, the archetypes, the symbolic representations we have, say, of reptilian predators, dragon in particular, are very, very deep. The dragon is a, a symbol that you find everywhere in the world. See, the way it looks to me is that we developed this predator detection system, right? What's in the unknown? A predator. What's the predator? It's a cat snake bird, which is exactly what it is, right? And you think, well, that's not a category. It's, yes, it is. It's a low resolution category that it's the same category as predator. And so, fire breathing cat snake bird covers a lot of territory. But it's even better than that because you say, well, what's in the unknown? So you project the contents of your imagination into the unknown to fill it. But the thing is, is that we're not just prey animals, we're also predatory and exploratory. And so, the, the dragon, the cat snake bird that breathes fire, isn't only a predator, it's also the thing that guards virgins and the thing that guards gold. We also, we have this bifurcated image of the predator, which is the predator slash unknown, which is also the place of new useful things. As you can see, there are some pretty good reasons for any fantasy writer to explore the dragon trope thoroughly. As I mentioned, one of the unique twists Skyrim writers did to dragons is the reality shifting and ancient dragon language the ability to speak with the words that can create fire or frost or tempest or worlds is by itself an ancient trope. Here is the bit that made me realize how deep in history you need to go to find its roots. There's been lots of embodiments of that. For the Mesopotamians it was Marduk. Marduk was the savior figure. He had eyes all the way around his head and he spoke magic words. That was his fun, that's what made him different from all the other gods. And he was elected by other, the, all the other gods to be their king. And then he went out and fought Tiamat, who's a great dragon, and made the world out of her pieces. One of his names was, he who makes ingenious things out of the combat with Tiamat. 
Well, that's what human beings do, is they go out into the unknown, into chaos, and they make ingenious things out of it. That's what we do. And so that, he's the found, Marduk was the founder of, of, of Mesopotamian civilization. Right, this is the founding myth of Western civilization, or at least a founding myth. The story mentioned by Peterson may be as old as 18th century BC, perhaps even older, no one knows for sure. But wait, Skyrim doesn't look like it was influenced by the Mesopotamian mythology, it has way too much snow for that. Nevertheless, mythologies of different parts of the world do have some strange commonalities and recurring motifs that seem to be almost inexplicable. If you'd like to explore the possible reasons for why that is, check uh, the links in the description. For now, let's just assume there is something to it. Let's get back to the magic speech motif. To understand it metaphorically, one must see the magic part in a broader sense, and the essence of magical thinking is that people can alter reality with a proper use of words or thought. It's not something exclusive to wizards, as we all speak to ourselves in our heads, to create new categories and terminology that would help us orient ourselves better and master our own little realities. The same very notion underlies the book of Genesis, where the Spirit of God creates order out of chaos by speaking, and then speaks the light and the earth and the sea into existence. The dream evolved in the Middle Ages into the mystical teachings of Jewish Kabbalists, who tried to suss out the question of what was the language of creation. They, of course, thought it was Hebrew. Of course it was Hebrew, what else? And the Christian Gnostic mystics thought it was Latin or Greek. There is a psychological substrate to all this mystical chatter, and it is the question of what is the language that allows for the best possible mastering of reality? What is the proper voice? Just look at what one of the emblems on the 7,000 steps in Skyrim reads. Before the birth of men, the dragons ruled all Mundus. Their word was the voice, and they spoke only for true needs. For the voice could blot out the sky and flood the land. And then this one. Men were born and spread over the face of Mundus. The dragons presided over the crawling masses. Men were weak then, and had no voice. And then this one. Kine called on Parthenox, who pitied man. Together they taught men to use the voice. The dragon war raged, dragon against tongue. So this Parthenax person sounds useful. So that's the dream. The dragonborn is the one who wields the ancient language of creation to kill the timeless, ageless, seemingly unkillable dragons of Tamriel. But what are the dragons in Skyrim symbolically? What are they doing in this game? Well, they are one of the oldest symbols of humankind. They arrive in fantasy all the time and emerge in all the mythologies of the world. The ideas behind them may vary, and they seem to be more of a positive symbol in the Chinese culture, for example, while in the West they are predominantly, although not exclusively, negative. That doesn't necessarily mean evil. We will get to the evil part later on. They tend to be associated with chaos, a formless realm of the unknown. To close the whole dragon introduction, let's listen to JBP one last time. The idea lurking behind the Sumerian creation myth, and then later lurking behind the entire edifice of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam for that matter, is that something that can be best represented by this figure is best conceptualized as the ground of everything that exists. Now what in the world can that mean? Well, it means something like this. Let's look at the concrete metaphorical representation. First of all, you have a kind of totality here, right? You, you have a thing that can live by devouring itself. So it has no need of anything outside of it. In fact, there is nothing outside of it. It's a figure of absolute totality. And it's characterized by a strange intermixture of metaphorical re representations of matter, because a snake is something that crawls on the ground, and spirit, because 
a winged serpent is something that can fly and therefore partakes of the metaphorical realm of heaven. Heaven and earth, right? Totality. Yin and yang from the Taoist perspective. That's the entire world. And it's also something that's characterized by the capacity for transformation because a snake can shed its skin and be reborn, so it's something that's constantly renewing itself despite its absolutely archaic age. And it's also something that presents a terrible danger and tremendous opportunity because a dragon is something that will burn you if you get anywhere near it, but also hoards a treasure that's more valuable than anything else. Being an agent of chaos is not the only thing a dragon does. Dragon holds insane treasures, ones that can make you stronger, like the treasure of the Norse dragon Fafnir, and ones that can save a whole society of people, like the dwarven treasury of the Lonely Mountain in The Hobbit. It can also teach you wisdom, at least Parthenax in Skyrim does that. Even the fire-breathing function of a dragon is symbolic as fire is also a representation of chaos and chaos in action, chaos destroying all order in sight. It can happen in your life, existentially speaking, when everything you thought to be true crumbles because you were betrayed or made some severe mistake and it happens to groups of people all the time when your society or your group of friends starts to drift apart for reasons you cannot really understand or grasp. All the categories you hold in your head become insufficient and fall apart in these situations. The destruction of categories is chaos. And so in the Norse mythology, Jormungandr, the primordial manifestation of what is beyond comprehension, the chaos itself, is defeated and tossed back into the sea, also a chaos symbol by the way, by the god Odin. It is a fairly similar story to that of the cosmic battle of Marduk and Tiamat from a completely different culture and era, and in Skyrim the lord of all dragons, Alduin himself, bears the name of the World Eater, which sounds like an apocalyptic symbol of all-consuming chaos as well. And it looks like the good versus evil axis of mythological imagination has not much to do with all this. It is all about chaos versus order, and it is much more ancient and fundamental to all of the mythologies of the world. Dragons in Skyrim are not exactly evil. There is no malevolence in them, right? They just act out their nature. They can't have any understanding or compassion to human beings because they don't understand mortality, which is explained by Parthenax when the player asks him about the dragon rend shout. It okay. was said to force a dragon to experience the concept of mortality. A truly von Mindoran. Incomprehensible idea to the immortal Doe. Well, it is actually a bit more complicated than that, seeing how Parthurnax himself is capable of pity and compassion, but he himself admits he had to meditate for millennia in order to control his own dragon nature. He is not surprised nor bitter if the player informs him about the blades wanting him dead. He knows that trusting a dragon is usually a bad idea. But wait, let's backtrack for a second. Skyrim's dragons cannot be just the representations of chaos. Fire is a symbol of chaos, but Skyrim's dragons can also breathe ice. And ice has a completely different set of connotations. Like for example in Dante's Inferno, and I don't mean the game, but the actual 14th century epic poem written by Dante Alighieri, the, the very bottom of hell is a frozen lake in which Lucifer is imprisoned. In the Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin, for example, yeah, the winter isn't chaos exactly, it's more like the slowly approaching end of all life. Chaos can be creative, whereas death, not so much. And in the brilliant novel Ice by Polish writer Jacek Dukaj, 
The freezing cold kingdom of winter is the place where no change is possible. You could say it's a kingdom of stasis. It is an extreme form of order, eradicating all fluidity and creativity. In socio-political terms, this horrifying extreme side of order is called tyranny, and the dragons of Skyrim once were the tyrants of humanity. As mentioned in the emblem, the dragons presided over the crawling masses. Men were weak then and had no voice. You can get more insight on this from the in-game book titled The Dragon War. Dragons, being dragons, embraced their role as god kings over men. After all, were they not fashioned in Akatosh's own image? Were they not superior in every way to the hordes of small, soft creatures that worshipped them? For dragons, power equals truth. They had the power, so therefore it must be truth. Dragons granted small amount of power to the dragon priests in exchange for absolute obedience. In turn, dragon priests ruled men as equals to the kings. Dragons, of course, could not be bothered with actually ruling. Yes, they were tyrant gods once before the race of men learned how to use the voice. Tyranny is an extreme form of order, the very opposite of chaos. Skyrim's dragons have a dual meaning then. They are the symbols of most extreme sides of chaos versus order spectrum, and both of these extremes are extremely dangerous, destructive and merciless. Both of these are dragons to slay. The basic western symbolism of a dragon as the creature of chaos is a split in two, however both of these extremes ultimately can uh, default to chaos. If you look at our history, everything that tyrannies can achieve is just pushing societies into complete madness of disarray and despair and complete destruction of any social order. So it's a kind of a kind of a tragic loop really. And Alduin himself is the tyrant god of dragons and all-consuming chaos at the same time. I do believe his symbolism is actually a bit deeper than that. And why? Well, remember when I said that good versus evil axis doesn't have much to do with Skyrim? I lied. Of course it has. Alduin is one of the most directly satanic figures in all of the Elder Scrolls games. Firstly, he feeds on the lost souls that cannot reach the heavenly palace in Sovngarde. Secondly, he proclaims in one of his combat quotes, This world is mine, which echoes uh, the New Testament notion of Satan as the prince of this world. Thirdly, he calls himself the firstborn son of a chief deity, Akatosh. Lucifer was deemed to be the first angel ever created by God, and medieval gnostics even go as far as calling him the firstborn of God. Fourthly, <laughs> Satan is depicted as a huge flipping dragon in the book of Revelation. Although, of course, the great dragon in Revelation is red, not black. The coloration of Alduin comes probably from you know, the Norse mythology, from the Norse dragon Nithog who himself is a rather diabolic fellow. Just look at this quote from the poetic Edda. A hole I saw, far from the sun, on Nastrond it stands, and the doors face north. Venom drops through the smoke vent down, for around the walls do serpents wind. I there so wading through rivers wild, treacherous men, and murderers too, and workers of ill with the wives of men. There Nithok sucked the blood of the slain, and the wolf tore men. And so Nithok is related to eternal torment of the wicked and the murderers, and his name means Malice Striker. Nith was also the word used for a social stigma or a curse placed by the Vikings on those who would betray their oaths, murder or lose their honor. So you have to be slightly amazed by this mix of motifs and tropes that are squeezed in the character of Alduin. I wonder if the writer's team did it on purpose or is it just all luck and <laughs> intuition. In any case, 
the lord of all malice, the lord of this world, the tormentor of souls, the harbinger of destruction, the enemy of human race, all these functions of the devil apply to Alduin very tightly. He is a symbol of the ultimate evil. What does all of this mean? Why is the lord of evil ruling over the creatures of tyranny and extreme chaos? Keeping in mind that Alduin is a representation of the ultimate evil, you could try to phrase it something like The ultimate evil is the thing that presides over the forces of extreme chaos and extreme order. Or because Alduin is also the one to resurrect all of the dragons you encounter in the game, maybe it's more like the ultimate evil is the thing that brings forth the long-forgotten abominations of chaos and order. And what is the Dragonborn's role in all of this? Well, he has the soul of a dragon, but he has to hunt them down if he wishes to save the world. The dragon's soul would be the symbol of our proclivity to turn to extremes, which we tend to do especially when the world, be it our personal world or the social world, seems to be danger, and the spirit of the extreme, of complete imbalance between order and chaos, lurks within the hero's soul. So how do you deal with that? The ancient wisdom of many cultures tells you to always try to stay in the middle, just in the center of the spectrum. The Greek philosophers, especially Aristotle, were frequently referring to the rule of the golden mean, or the golden middle way which was deemed to be the best, most ethical mode of being. The excess of any virtue can produce either a parody of said virtue or its direct opposite. The Taoist symbol of yin-yang shows a perfect balance of the masculine and feminine forces of nature, which may also mean the balance of chaos and order. The Dragonborn is trying to push back against these extremes, even though they dwell in his soul. He is trying to stay in the middle by pushing the extremes away. And he does that by using speech. He refines his words, his ideas, you could say, by slaying the dragons of tyranny and destructive chaos, so he can be prepared for stronger, more extreme manifestations of these forces. Rinse and repeat. This process in our more mundane world is called growing the hell up. You think, you encounter your own little dragons, you defeat them with words and or thinking. And however hard the fight is, if you win, you emerge a better person, wiser, more mature. You get the better, the more magical words from all that which is symbolized by absorbing dragon souls and unlocking new words of power. And you are doing this through debate. As Parternax says, there is nothing else but philosophy to a dragon. It is no accident that we do battle with our thum, our voices. There is no distinction between debate and combat to a dragon. So you could interpret the Skyrim main story as a cycle of exhausting, difficult conversations, every one of which refines your ability to use the language of creation, the words that actually matter, uh, that can change something, convince someone, bring some actual solace, a bit of true peace of mind to you or your close ones. These really important talks are always kind of like a combat because there's always something dangerous in them, you can always learn something difficult about yourself or about the, the other person. These talks can bruise you, and each time in these serious talks you will encounter something horrible, a monstrous extreme of tyranny and destructive chaos. They dwell both within and without. In defeating these extremes you refine your very soul. Well, who knows, do it long enough and maybe you can even defeat the ultimate evil that presides over the abominable forces of chaos and tyranny. Postpone the apocalypse for a while? That would be nice. Well, alright then. In summary, I've heard and read a lot of complaints about Skyrim's story being uh, uninventive and uh, stereotypical over the years. but. It is clear to me that some stories just have to be this way. Skyrim uses 
some of the oldest tropes and, and storytelling techniques. And that's okay, because you can imbue a story like this with a lot of philosophy and, and your own personal meaning. Look at the Middle-earth mythology in comparison. There, is a, there was a lot of complaints back in the Tolkien's days, when he first published The Lord of the Rings. He tried to, to, to skew the original meanings to make them more, well, Christian, because he was a very religious guy. You can have this very familiar looking world and a very familiar symbol of a dragon and still do something original with it. Going with the ideas of Joseph Campbell, all the heroic mythological stories are about, you know, growing up in some sense because they are all tied to the dreams and the dreams are trying to tell you something about yourself and provide you a guideline that's as the Jungian notion of dream. Skyrim does a decent job in embedding a set of very specific meanings in this broad scope of, of an archetypical dreamlike hero story. Alright, and that's the end of this video essay, as I called it, to make myself more important <laughs> and posh sounding. <laughs> Alright, as always I welcome the conversation in the comments section and uh, let me know because I might I might just make more of these, not only about Skyrim, maybe maybe we should just analyze a lot of other Bethesda games in this fashion. Of course there will be other content too, if you are interested look at my Skyrim builds and all that and we will see each other again. Bye bye. So apparently killing dragons is not enough, taming them and riding them is not enough, now we have to go off and capture one. What's next? Marry one?